On September 11, 1970, Vice President Spiro Agnew was speaking to reporters at a political event. At this point in President Nixon's first term, years before the Watergate scandal, the administration felt besieged by the news media over many issues, especially the war in Vietnam, and they were not happy about it. So at one carefully calculated moment, Vice President Agnew uttered one of the most memorable phrases in American political history. The news media, he said, was dominated by a cohort of, quote, nattering nabobs of negativism. Nattering nabobs of negativism. If there's a hall of fame for political messaging, that phrase is surely in it. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more... Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 18. We are coming to you this week from the I Like Ike Studios, located somewhere outside of Boston, Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook and Twitter, where my handle is, In The Past Lane. The maestro at the head of this motley orchestra, keeping us in sync with her golden baton, is executive producer, Lulu Spencer. Hey, Lulu, I need to bring the music down a tad. How do I do it? Would you just push the button? Okay. Right. Got it. Well, people, where to begin? There are so many great things happening at In the Past Lane, and it's all due to you, our loyal listeners. Thank you so much for spreading the word about this podcast, telling friends about it, liking us on Facebook, and following us on Twitter and Instagram. It's all because of you that the number of our listeners continues to grow. And if you're one of our new listeners, we'd really appreciate it if you headed over to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts, and subscribe to In the Past Lane. And then, after subscribing, we'd really appreciate it if you left a starred review. Reviews are so very important for pulling in new listeners, and it only takes a minute to leave one. Thanks. All right, well, I hope all is well with you as we head into late October. Here in New England, the fall season is in full glory. As some of you know, I'm a pretty serious runner, or at least I'm out there running a lot, and this is the one time of year when I break one of my cardinal rules. Never stop running. That's because so often these days, when I'm out on one of my morning runs, I can't resist stopping to take a photo of the amazing, dazzling fall foliage. Up here, we call it nature's fireworks. I'll post a photo or two at our show page for this episode at inthepastlane.com. And speaking of running, I'm just a few days away from running the New York City Marathon on November 6th. I'll be running as part of the Michael J. Fox Foundation team. They are raising money to help find a cure for Parkinson's disease. If you're interested in supporting my run with a tax-deductible donation, head to the show page for this episode, where you'll find a link and all the information you need. And thanks for your support. Okay, enough about me. What's up this week at In the Past Lane? Well, I'm so excited to bring you an incredibly interesting interview with historian Nicole Hemmer. She's just published a fascinating book on the rise of conservative media in the three decades before the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. Hammer tells the story of the people and institutions in the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s who used media to help create and then build the modern conservative movement. Given this crazy election season, with the many questions it's raised about the state of the Republican Party, the conservative movement, and key conservative media outlets like Fox News, this is a remarkably well-timed book. Okay, people. Ignore that jerk who just cut you off. Stay positive and think about the big picture, because your journey in the past lane begins now. 
Okay, it's my pleasure to welcome to In the Past Lane, historian Nicole Hemmer. Nicole is an assistant professor of presidential studies at the University of Virginia's Miller Center. She is also a U.S. News and World Report contributing editor. Nicole is also the co-host of a fabulous podcast that you should all check out, Past Present. This podcast features three historians who engage in fascinating conversations about the historical roots of current events. Nicole is on the line today because she has recently published her first book, Messengers of the Right, Conservative Media and the Transformation of American Politics, just published by Penn Press. Nicole Hemmer, welcome to In the Past Lane. Thanks so much for having me, Ed. Well, I want to start by just asking a kind of an overarching question. Your book covers roughly a 30-year period from the early 50s until about 1980. And maybe you could just start out by telling us what the focus, there's a lot of books on American conservatism, post-war conservatism. What is your particular focus in this book? So there are quite a number of books on American conservatism, and many of them mention conservative media somewhere in their pages. But what makes Messengers of the Right different is that it puts those, what I call media activists, front and center in the story. So the story that I tell is one of people who were looking for political change, who turned to new media enterprises in order to create that change. And in the process, they didn't just found new enterprises, they founded organizations and they moved conservatives into politics as voters. And so in many ways, they built the conservative movement. And so having those media actors front and center, instead of making them the end game, you know, and After the movement is built in the post-war era, and then you have the election of Ronald Reagan, and then you have Rush Limbaugh and Fox News, the story I tell is one of media activists who are there from the beginning. Right. So the 40 years leading up to Limbaugh's program, I think, comes online in the early 90s, and Fox News is 96, I think. Right. So Rush Limbaugh becomes nationally syndicated in 1988, and then he has a short-lived television program from 1992 to 96, and then Fox News goes live in 96. Right. So your focus is not on Limbaugh and Fox, what we might call the second generation of conservative media. Instead, your book actually explores the first generation of what you term conservative media activists. And what's interesting is that even for people well-versed in American political history, some of the key figures in this story are largely unknown. I mean, many people, of course, know about conservative icons like William F. Buckley and Robert Taft. But I'm guessing almost no one knows about Clarence Mannion and Dan Smoot. Two people that, as you point out in your book, wielded extraordinary influence on American politics, starting in the 1950s. Yes, so Clarence Mannion and Dan Smoot, these are people who you may have heard of if you've read deep into the histories of conservatism, but otherwise they've largely been lost to history. And I think that's because they were broadcasters instead of writers. That means that when these personalities died or retired, They didn't have a show that continued on after them. They very much had these single personality shows that we don't really have a living archive of in the same way that you can go to the library and you can read back issues of National Review or human events. You can check out books that Henry Regnery published in the 50s and 60s to promote conservatism. And of course, Regnery Publishing continues on to this day, as does National Review, as does human events. But these broadcasters have largely been lost to history because there is no reachable archive of them. That said, they were incredibly influential, especially Clarence Mannion. Clarence Mannion is someone who started on radio in 1954, and he initially was given 13 weeks of airtime, where he would go on once a week for 15 minutes in order to talk about his foreign policy ideas, some of his thoughts on conservatism. And the show became so popular and so valuable that he ends up running it for 25 years nonstop. And so it becomes this real institution within conservative media and also within conservative media activism because Clarence Mannion is out there starting organizations. He's getting involved in political campaigns as early as 1956, trying to get conservatives on the national ticket. He's a prime mover behind Barry Goldwater's conscience of the conservative. So he's someone who was vitally important, not just to conservative media, but to conservative politics, but who, again, because his radio show ended, has long been lost to history. Right. And I think up until, is it true to say that up until people like Mannion, that the real media people were basically traditional newspaper editors, you know, McCormick and others who were key figures, but basically, you know, conservative voices of mainstream print media. And that what's new is that 
this new dimension of reaching different audiences through radio, and then also the books and the magazines that, that are a part of that project. That's right. In the 1930s and the 1940s, there was this sort of personal journalism of these newspapers and newspaper syndicates that were headed by Republicans. So you had people like Robert McCormick running the Chicago Tribune or Frank Gannett and the Gannett newspapers. And so you have this sort of Republican press to the extent that people talked about bias in media. They really talked about Republican bias and they were largely talking about these newspaper owners. But I would say the difference is not just the medium, but the difference is also that these newspaper publishers and editors were to a certain extent still constrained by the idea of objectivity. They might have very strong opinions on their opinion pages. They might slant their story choice, but they still were tied to these journalistic values that defined newspaper journalism in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. That wasn't the case for the conservative media figures of the 50s and beyond. They saw themselves as primarily engaged in ideological projects, in media outlets that were going to promote conservative policies and conservative ideas and didn't have to make a nod to objectivity as their sort of North Star. Right. They could really fully claim the idea that they were activists. One thing that's interesting to me is the degree to which there's a struggle going on, starting with their activism in the 1950s. And to some extent, they're all Republicans, but they're also conservatives, and they're not the same thing. And so one of their, some of their earliest efforts in the 50s is to really take on the Republican Party, which they see as far too often caving to these centrist Republican New Dealers, I think they call Eisenhower, and really hoping to get a conservative on the ticket, or in several cases, to start a third party. That's right. So in addition to having this critique of media as being biased, there was also this shared sense that the two parties had colluded together to shut out conservative ideas. And this is something that actually predates the post-war conservative movement. A lot of these conservative activists who I talk about in the book actually have their moment of political awakening around World War II. They are part of the America First Committee, a part of the anti-intervention movement, and they think that the press is blacking out these anti-interventionist ideas, and they think that both parties have been working together in order to keep a non-interventionist off of a major party ticket. And so this language of a press blackout, of a party blackout, of a bipartisan conspiracy is really operative as early as 1939, 1940. But once you get into the post-war era, this becomes more of an issue, not of pro-intervention bias but of liberal bias. This belief that not just the media, but both parties are shutting out their ideas. And the big piece of evidence for conservatives when it comes to this idea of a bipartisan blackout is what happens with the 1952 election. So when the Republicans are looking for their nominee, the next person in line was Robert Taft of Ohio. And he was the darling of conservatives within the Republican Party. Even someone like Clarence Mannion, who was himself a Democrat throughout his life, was a big Taft guy because of his conservatism. But what happens in the 1952 election? This upstart, this person with no political experience, whose calling card is his celebrity in the United States that he got from essentially winning World War II, Dwight Eisenhower, who wasn't even really a Republican, swoops in and he grabs the nomination. And for conservatives, they saw this as evidence that the nomination had been rigged, that the Republican Party was working to keep conservatives off of the national ticket. And it's that sense of betrayal that comes out of first the 1952 nomination drive, and then the fight between Dwight Eisenhower and Joe McCarthy over communism that really convinces these activists that even though the Republican Party looked like their best hope, that there wasn't space for them there. And so that's when they start going off into third party forays, most of which were pretty futile as many third-party ventures in the United States tend to be. And they probably would have continued to look for third parties had it not been for Barry Goldwater and his insistence that if he were going to run for president, that he was going to run as a Republican. So there would be no third-party try with Goldwater at the head. And that brought conservatives back to the Republican Party and back to the belief that the GOP was going to be their natural home. And that part of that process was the creation, in some ways, of the reinvention of Goldwater 
as not just a well-known national figure in Republican Party circles, but really the face of conservatism. And this is probably one of the areas where these media activists, their, some of their earliest, most evident successes are in the elevation of Goldwater as this national face of conservatism. And it, a lot of it hinges on the publication of that book that you mentioned earlier, Conscience of a Conservative. How does Goldwater emerge from the pack as their choice? So Clarence Mannion, after the 1956 nomination race, he had been the campaign manager for a third-party ticket that was headed by T. Coleman Andrews. And Andrews was from Virginia, and he was running on a states' rights ticket. And it was very evident to Mannion, after Andrews' fairly limited showing in 1956, that if he were going to unite conservatives across the nation behind one person, that person couldn't be from the Jim Crow South. It just wasn't going to be possible to build a national coalition that way. And so he was looking for someone who could unite both Southern white Democrats and Taft conservatives in the North and libertarian conservatives in the West. And Barry Goldwater seemed like the natural choice. So in 1957, Mannion has Goldwater on his program, and he has him back a few times over the next couple of years. And in those conversations, he becomes convinced that Goldwater really is a principled conservative. And Mannion wants to convince all the other conservatives that Goldwater is their man. And so what he does is he decides that there should be some sort of Goldwater manifesto. Goldwater doesn't really have time to write this. So Mannion gets Brent Bozell, who was a writer for National Review and also a speechwriter for Goldwater, to ghostwrite a manuscript. And then Mannion asks around. He tries to find a publisher for this manuscript, can't find it. This convinces him that the book publishing companies are, are arrayed against conservatives, and he decides to self-publish it. And that book, Conscience of a Conservative, goes on to become a best-selling book. And it puts Goldwater on the map, but it puts him on the map in a distinct way as the face of conservatism. And coming immediately off of the publication of Conscience of a Conservative in 1960 is Mannion's attempt to win Goldwater the nomination for the Republican Party. He starts something called Americans for Goldwater. Goldwater assents to have this group help him win the nomination. They fail because Nixon is sort of the next in line as the vice president. But it begins to build the groundwork for a Goldwater nomination run in 1964. And so that work of defining Goldwater as the face of conservatism really is a project of conservative media. Well, that sets up the much anticipated election of 1964. So Goldwater uh, does win the nomination and squares off against Lyndon B. Johnson and high hopes until the aftermath of Election Day. So what's important about, I mean, Goldwater suffers the worst defeat in, in modern times in terms of a you know, landslide. And there are many predictions or many assessments that are quite different. You know, some people say this is the beginning of the beginning, and the people say this is the effective end of conservatism as we know it. What do conservatives do in the aftermath of the Goldwater defeat? So if you were to open the New York Times on the day after the Goldwater defeat, you would hear that story of the end of conservatism. Essentially, what the Times said was, you know, yesterday's landslide defeat wasn't just a defeat for Goldwater, but was a defeat for the entire conservative cause. And there were a lot of conservatives who woke up the next day not feeling really great about what had happened. But they actually rallied pretty quickly. They looked around and they said, you know, we are a fairly small movement. We managed within about 10 years to capture the nomination of a major party. And this is something for us to build on. But what they said was that what has been done with just conservatives has been done. And it turns out not to be enough. Even if all of the 26.9 million votes cast for Goldwater were all conservative votes, that's not enough to win an election. So what we have to do is stop just talking to ourselves and start reaching out to new audiences. And as media figures, this meant that they had to change their distribution methods. They needed to try new media like television. Uh, they needed to take their same products, maybe the same books that they used to publish, the same radio programs they've always aired, but find new distribution mechanisms to get them in the hands of people who weren't their natural audience or their natural allies. And so that's what happens over the course of the 1960s. In 1966, William F. Buckley launches Firing Line on PBS. 
eventually on PBS. And so that gets a face of conservatism out there. Somebody like Mannion begins to have what are known as the Mannion Forum footnotes. These are little three-minute radio programs that are perfectly sized for people who are riding to and from work in their car. You can just get this little snippet of conservatism to consume on your way to and from work or to and from the grocery store. And so these new experiments with distribution are ways of reaching out to new audiences. But they also start working on their political techniques. So one of the big things that happens after the 1964 election is the founding of the American Conservative Union. And there were a number of conservative media activists who were behind the founding of the ACU. And this is it's an organization still around today whose main goal is political activism, political organization, political messaging, the kinds of nuts and bolts work that is necessary in order to be politically effective. And isn't one of their tasks also to evaluate other people and to come up with these objective measures, or at least their own measures of just how conservative somebody is? Uh, there's great seems to be great concern starting in the 50s, but really in this late 60s or into the 70s period of literally coming up with rating systems of just how conservative people are so that nobody's fooled. Yeah, this is an important project of the early 1960s even. So in this period where conservatism and its relationship to the two major parties is still in flux, in the late 1950s and early 1960s, there's this concern that party ID isn't a really good signifier of whether a candidate is conservative or not. You have white racial conservatives in the South, you have conservatives in the North, and some might be in the Republican Party. Obviously, the Southern ones are in the Democratic Party. So how do you figure out who's genuinely conservative and genuinely conservative in the way that whatever organization is doing the evaluating defines conservatism? And so starting as early as 1959, you have Americans for Constitutional Action, the ACA, creating a ranking system where they pick 10 to 20 votes cast to every session in Congress, and they determine what counts as a conservative vote. And then they rank all of the members of Congress by how conservative they are based on their voting record. And this is to both get past party ID and to get past rhetoric, right? They're saying, you might be told a lot of conservative things by people who are in Congress, but how does it really play out on the ground? And so this ACA ranking system is something that a publication like Human Events or like National Review uses to signal to their readers how conservative a member of Congress is. So it's a way of evaluating conservatism separate from party identification. And that's really important during this era in which party ID and ideology are in flux. I think one of its other outcomes, too, is that it provides upstarts and self-defined real conservatives the opportunity in primaries to say, do you know my opponent has only a 32 rating uh, from the ACA or from some, some of these organizations? He's a Republican, but he's actually not really a conservative Republican, and I am. Absolutely. So again, it's training conservatives to look for indicators of ideology. And that's so important in the primaries. It's so important in the general election because you want to start getting conservatives to lose their allegiance to a particular political party. And that was something that was a big obstacle to overcome in the 1950s and 1960s when Americans were more attached to parties. They had lifelong allegiances to parties that had to be slowly broken apart. And of course, things like the Civil Rights Act began to loosen some of those allegiances. But one of the purposes of these rating systems is to make sure that whatever took its place, that conservatives had some sort of indicator of the ideology of the people they were voting for, so that they would continue to look out for that as politics developed over the next few decades. All right, this seems like a good place to take a short break. But don't go anywhere, people. In just a couple minutes, I'll continue my conversation with historian Nicole Hemmer about her new book that chronicles the fascinating history of the rise of conservative media long before Fox News and Breitbart. As we head to the break, let's listen to the one positive outcome of the 1964 election for the Republican Party. That was a speech by Ronald Reagan on October 27, 1964, just two weeks before the election, a speech titled A Time for Choosing. 
As you'll hear, it's a speech that reflects the Cold War fears and anxieties of the mid-1960s. Now, this speech failed to rally the American people to vote for Barry Goldwater, but it did signal the emergence of Ronald Reagan as a formidable voice within the GOP. Let's take a listen to an excerpt from that famous speech. Those who would trade our freedom for the soup kitchen of the welfare state have told us they have a utopian solution of peace without victory. They call their policy accommodation. And they say if we'll only avoid any direct confrontation with the enemy, he'll forget his evil ways and learn to love us. All who oppose them are indicted as warmongers. They say we offer simple answers to complex problems. Well, perhaps there is a simple answer. Not an easy answer, but simple. If you and I have the courage to tell our elected officials that we want our national policy based on what we know in our hearts is morally right, we cannot buy our security, our freedom from the threat of the bomb by committing an immorality so great as saying to a billion human beings now enslaved behind the Iron Curtain, give up your dreams of freedom because to save our own skins, we're willing to make a deal with your slave masters. Alexander Hamilton said, a nation which can prefer disgrace to danger is prepared for a master and deserves one. Now let's set the record straight. There's no argument over the choice between peace and war, but there's only one guaranteed way you can have peace, and you can have it in the next second. Surrender. Admittedly, there's a risk in any course we follow other than this, but every lesson of history tells us that the greater risk lies in appeasement. And this is the specter our well-meaning liberal friends refuse to face, that their policy of accommodation is appeasement. And it gives no choice between peace and war, only between fight or surrender. If we continue to accommodate, continue to back and retreat, eventually we have to face the final demand, the ultimatum. And what then? You and I know and do not believe that life is so dear and peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery. If nothing in life is worth dying for, when did this begin? Just in the face of this enemy? Or should Moses have told the children of Israel to live in slavery under the pharaohs? Should Christ have refused the cross? Should the patriots at Concord Bridge have thrown down their guns and refused to fire the shot heard round the world? The martyrs of history were not fools. And our honored dead who gave their lives to stop the advance of the Nazis didn't die in vain. Where then is the road to peace? Well, it's a simple answer after all. You and I have the courage to say to our enemies, there is a price we will not pay. There is a point beyond which they must not advance. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. We will keep in mind and remember that Barry Goldwater has faith in us, He has faith that you and I have the ability and the dignity and the right to make our own decisions and determine our own destiny. Thank you very much. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. If you are enjoying this podcast, then please subscribe to In the Past Lane at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you access your podcasts. Subscribing is free, and once you do it, new episodes of In the Past Lane are automatically downloaded to your listening device. Subscribing also gives you access to the entire back catalog of In the Past Lane episodes. And if you do subscribe, please leave a review. Thanks. Okay, we're back. Before the break, Nicole Hammer and I were talking about the aftermath of Barry Goldwater's humiliating defeat to Lyndon Johnson in the 1964 campaign for president. Let's pick up that story now in 1968, with what might seem like a surprising reaction among conservative media activists to the election of Republican Richard M. Nixon. So they're licking their wounds a little bit from the Goldwater defeat, but then comes another kind of 
moment just four years later where it's a victory, but, you know, another sort of crisis moment where Nixon is the party nominee and Nixon wins. And rather than being celebrated up and down the line of conservatism, people have very different interpretations of what it actually means. So how does the movement deal with the victory by a guy like Nixon and how that plays out over the course of his term? The positioning around the 1968 election and around Richard Nixon is, I think, one of the most fascinating things about this generation of conservative media. You have a number of very visible conservative media activists who have absolutely no time for someone like Richard Nixon. I think my favorite example of this is Bill Rusher. So Bill Rusher, who was the publisher of National Review, had deep resentments about Nixon going back to the 1950s. And that can be confusing for people who think about Nixon in the 1950s as a red hunter, right? The person who made his reputation off of his work on the House Un-American Activities Committee. But for conservatives, Richard Nixon was part of the Eisenhower administration. He was part of the team that invited Nikita Khrushchev to come to the United States, which was something that conservatives saw as a great betrayal in the Cold War. And so by the time Nixon ran for president in 1960, conservatives had had enough of him. And certainly by 1968, he hadn't improved his reputation. And so there's a lot of infighting at a place like National Review about what to do about Richard Nixon, because it's not just that Richard Nixon isn't quite a conservative, but Richard Nixon is reaching out to conservative media. He's reaching out to people like conservative columnists, people at National Review, people at Human Events, because he understands from Goldwater's nomination that he needs to win conservatives over, and he chooses to try to win conservatives over by wooing their media. And to be frank, it mostly works. Somebody like Buckley becomes enamored of Nixon because conservatives, too, are looking to compromise. They were looking for ways to win power, but they knew that if you just did it with conservatives, you have another gold water. And so even though there's a lot of split within the conservative movement around the 1968 election, Ronald Reagan had been in the hunt for the nomination for a little bit. You had somebody like George Wallace, who appealed to a lot of conservatives. By and large, people at places like National Review support Nixon going into the 68 election. And there are benefits to that, and there are losses to that. Again, Nixon isn't a true conservative, so he's not going to look out only for conservative ideas and conservative policies. But he does things like mainstreaming this idea of media bias, which is so important to contemporary conservatism and helps them to get that message out there that maybe the media aren't really objective and maybe they do need to be balanced by voices on the right. So that's a big coup for them. On the other hand, you know, Nixon not being a conservative doesn't do what conservatives want, particularly when it comes to foreign policy. And Nixon's decision to go to China in 1972 is an absolute breaking point for his relationship with the conservative movement. Even Bill Buckley, who had been probably the most enamored of Richard Nixon in the first four years of his presidency, even Buckley says, we can no longer support Richard Nixon, that he has lost perhaps forever the moral standing of the United States and the world. And in 1971, when Richard Nixon announces that he's going to be opening China, there's a letter put out by a number of conservative media figures who say, we're suspending our support unless you rethink this adventure to China. And he doesn't. And so in 1972, Bill Rusher and Tom Winter of Human Events organize a primary challenge, John Ashbrook's No Left Turn campaign, in order to make visible conservative discomfort and conservative opposition to the Nixon presidency. So it's a, it's a complex and it's a mixed bag of an administration for conservatives. And it's one in which a lot of the tensions within conservative media are laid bare. And Nixon also, I mean, on the domestic front, a number of things certainly alarmed conservatives. You know, when we look back, we say Nixon had this in you know, his record on an environment, on things like OSHA and many other things really shock people that this came out of the Nixon administration, certainly not part of the conservative agenda. Right. And there are people like Bob Kephart, who is the publisher of Human Events, who from the start has no time for Richard Nixon. And he is constantly beating up on National Review for providing cover for Nixon, which really National Review was doing. So in the first 
two to three years of Nixon's administration, there were all of these apostasies in domestic policy, whether it was economic policy or whether it was signing into law something like the Environmental Protection Agency. But he got a lot of cover because of his relationship with conservative media figures like Buckley. But somebody like Kephart is taunting Bill Rusher over at National Review and saying, uh, you guys keep looking for the secret conservatism of Richard Nixon. And what you're doing in the process is betraying your own conservatism. And there's a lot of this behind the scenes fighting because, again, Nixon isn't a conservative. And the way that a publication like National Review really bends over backwards for Nixon in print over the first few years of his presidency is alarming to conservative media activists who see this as a selling out of true, pure conservatism. Yeah, it's this ever evolving or, you know, the latest chapter in this battle between purity and power. Absolutely. You can have purity, but you might not have power. So Nixon ultimately goes, his administration collapses in the in the Watergate uh, scandal and conservatives are now back at another moment of truth. And we know how this plays out. Eventually, by the, the end of the 1970s, it's the reemergence of, of Ronald Reagan. So maybe you could take us in that last portion of your book where you talk about what conservatives, the conservative movement and media activists in particular do in the 1970s that get us to that moment of Ronald Reagan's ascendancy. This is one of those places where knowing how the story ends can really skew the way that we understand what conservatism was like in the 1970s. So you have Richard Nixon leaving office in 1974, and you still have a Republican president in Gerald Ford. And we know that Ronald Reagan is waiting in the wings. He's just about to ascend to power in the United States. But conservatives didn't know that. And in fact, in the 1970s, conservative media had fallen on really hard times. Inflation had eaten into most of, well, they never really had any profits, but were causing them to have higher and higher deficits. A place like Regnery Publishing, Regnery Publishing essentially stops publishing conservative books in the early 1970s. It was something that Henry Regnery could never make profitable and that his son-in-law ultimately took over the business and started publishing books that made money, but that had nothing to do with conservatism. The Mannion Forum was on fewer and fewer stations. They'd lost their television reach altogether. National Review saw its circulation go down. Human Events was doing fundraising drives for the first time in its history. They just didn't have a lot of money and they didn't have a lot of energy. There was a lot of discussion in the editorial rooms of a place like National Review about this idea that they had lost their way, that they were more devoted to contrarianism than to conservatism. And over at the Mannion Forum, there was a lot of concern that they were fighting the battles of the 1950s and 60s, and they were no longer on the cutting edge of conservatism. And so there's this sense of ennui and of loss, really, in the mid-1970s. And someone like Bill Rusher at National Review, he doesn't see the Republican Party as a place that conservatives can really make a home anymore. He sees the adventures of the 1960s and the 1970s as a sign that there really is a need for a third party. So he spends much of 1975 and 1976 trying to organize a third party ticket. He wants Ronald Reagan to lead it. And Reagan, like Goldwater, is like, look, I'm going to try to win the Republican nomination. But if I don't, I'm not going to make a third party run. Like Goldwater, he was a Republican first. And that put him in conflict with conservatives from time to time. And so by the time you reach the 1976 election and the victory of Jimmy Carter, you really are at what I think is a low point for conservative media. And so we often talk about the 1970s as the rising tide of conservative populism and this idea that they're making the way for Ronald Reagan. But that's not what it looked like from inside conservative media. In conservative media, it was a time of loss. And what it meant was that when Ronald Reagan wins the nomination and the White House, conservative media aren't leading the way. They're sort of trailing behind. And I think that, you know, this might be part of the reason why Reagan has such a successful presidency in the eyes, not only of conservatives, but of independents as well. And that is that he doesn't have to be constantly batted about by conservatives. I mean, he faces a little bit of flack from people on the new right. But by and large, when you have publications like National Review or Human Events, 
who are writing about Reagan, they don't really have any power over Reagan or within the Reagan administration. So mostly they are writing off of the reflected glory of Reagan rather than having any real effect on pulling him in their direction. So Reagan gets to govern largely free of that conservative pull that you'll see in future Republican administrations and candidacies. Yeah, it's sort of an interlude in some ways where the disarray and the uncertainty of what direction to go in, it it frees him up quite a bit. And then not too long afterward, really, you mentioned that Limbaugh's program is syndicated in 1988. And it's really a marker for beginning of a new phase of of media activism that takes us right up to the present day. Right. And that media activism, even though it grows out of this first generation, in many ways, it's very different. Most of the conservative media activists of the late 80s and the 1990s going forward were entertainers first. Somebody like Rush Limbaugh was a disc jockey. Somebody like Roger Ailes of Fox News got his start in entertainment media and things like The Mike Douglas Show, which was one of those entertainment variety shows. And their politics came second. That entertainment background meant that they had a very different type of show that blended entertainment and politics that ended up being much more profitable and in a way ended up being much more powerful in its relationship to the Republican Party. And the most telling sign of this turn was in 1992, When Rush Limbaugh, who was a media juggernaut, by 1992, he was a cover story kind of guy because he was such a phenomenon and nobody really knew what kind of effect he might have on the 1992 election because he hadn't been particularly recognized in 1988 during the last presidential election. But he was very popular among conservatives. He was saying a lot of nice things about third party candidate Ross Perot during the lead up to the 92 election. And this was making George H.W. Bush, who was not looking great in his re-election campaign, it made him nervous. And so what he does is he invites two people to come spend the night at the White House, Rush Limbaugh and Roger Ailes. And it's his way of courting conservatives through their media. And it effectively works. Rush Limbaugh starts saying really nice things about Bush on his radio program after that. And he stops beating the drum for Perot quite as much. Now, it doesn't win George H.W. Bush re-election. So there's a limit to that power. But this idea that a president needed to court conservative media in order to shore up a conservative base, that was something, you know, Richard Nixon had done a little bit, but Bush really was trying to win over conservatives through Rush Limbaugh. And that was an important change, and it signified the growing power of conservative media. Yeah, it appears the stakes were much, much higher. And now here we are in, in 2016, and we probably could talk for three hours about you know the Trump phenomenon and, <laughs> and how that is a product of media activism and conservative movement folks. But what do you see, I mean, what's your, what's your I mean, I don't even know how to ask this question. What do you see as reflective in, in the, the Trump movement and the rise of Donald Trump that has some connection to the past and situate it for us, if you would? So there is something very familiar about the divisions that are running through conservative media at this moment. So the kinds of fights that were being had over Richard Nixon in 1968 are being had over Donald Trump in 2016. You know, you have National Review, which came out with its against Trump issue back in the spring, where the magazine came out categorically against Trump, even if he were to win the nomination, which he since has. And then you have folks like Sean Hannity, who are very much in the Trump camp and are very vocal about the never Trump conservatives as people who are helping Hillary Clinton get elected. But I actually think there's something bigger going on here. A reporter had asked me about 18 months ago whether the rise of the internet signaled the coming of a third generation of conservative media. And at the time, I said no, because it looked like conservatives were largely using this new social media and the internet in order to replicate the things that they had been doing throughout the second generation. So doing that sort of talk radio style, but just doing it digitally. But with the rise of the alt-right and with the hiring of Steve Bannon of Breitbart to run the Trump campaign, I think that it may be possible to say that what we're seeing is the rise of a third generation, perhaps not of conservative media, but of right-wing media. Because a site like Breitbart doesn't define itself as conservative or right-wing anymore. It defines itself as populist nationalist. 
And so you could see a scenario where, and I don't know if we'll know this for another decade or so, but where the rise of digital media have fragmented and in many ways fractured not just conservative media, but the conservative movement, that it's created so much extra space for so many more different types of voices and for an interactive medium that helps to nurture a particular type of populism, that what we're in fact seeing in the rise of the alt-right and in the rise of Breitbart is a new type of right-wing media that isn't as married to conservative ideas and conservative policies. And that definitely strikes me as something new and something distinctly different from both the first and second generations. Yeah. And it will be, as you say, 10 years out, we'll have a better view of whether it simply changes the Republican Party or if it leads, as some people predict, to a fracturing, an actual fracturing of the Republican Party. As historians, we can we can tell what happened and explain what happened, but we we're not good at the the prediction game. Nobody is, so right. we'll have to wait. And, more more hindsight than foresight. That's right. Well, that's a great segue into my final question, which is to ask you to tell us a little bit about your terrific podcast, Past Present. You have two other co-hosts. Tell us tell us about it and how you came to the idea and how it's going so far. You are up to episode fifty something at this point. That's right. We just taped episode 51 this morning, and our one-year anniversary is going to be on October 1st. So we've been at it for a year. But the actual idea for our podcast, Past Present, which I co-host with Natalia Petrozella and Neil Young, two other historians, I was getting ready to leave teaching. I had been teaching for three years at the University of Miami, and I was reorienting my career towards more journalism, more public engagement, and focusing less on traditional tenure-track academia. And I knew I was going to miss teaching. And I was trying to think of something that would fill that same need that teaching had always filled, that combination of performance and education and just getting to talk about a wide range of historical ideas and topics. And for some reason, I just instantly thought, well, podcasts. A podcast would fill all of those needs. And so I started talking with Neil, who was a very good friend of mine. He was teaching at Princeton at the time. And he mentioned to me that he'd always wanted to start a podcast. And so we brought our friend Natalia on board. And what we do is each week we talk about three different things in the news and we put them in a historic context. And it's sort of an extension of the writing that I've been doing for the past four or five years. I write a weekly column for US News. Now I write a fortnightly column for an Australian syndicate. And one of the things that I've wanted to do in my writing about current events is to try to reframe political debate through a historical lens to get us out of the parochialism and the partisanship of the present and try to ask different questions. And I hope that on our best days, (laughs) that's what we're doing at Past Present, is taking something like the alt-right or taking something like the taco truck controversy or even something like the 50th anniversary of Star Trek, that we can take something that people are paying attention to and talk about it in a new and refreshing way that gets us out of the immediate contemporary debates and helps us infuse our conversations with history and historical analysis and all of the interesting new questions that looking at things through a historical lens can raise seems to me that there are many ways to summarize what you do, but one of them is to sort of point out again and again that everything has a history and that history matters. So whether it's the burkini and linking and, and everything, is, there's so many ways to link things to other things that wouldn't necessarily come to, to mind right away by looking at it through a historical lens. So, you know, talking about the burkini links back to earlier 20th century debates about any kind of bathing suit for women, and it opens up all kinds of fascinating conversations. Yeah, I think that's what makes it so fun for us and hopefully so fun for our listeners is that bringing that historical angle to things leads you into unexpected spaces. And those are my favorite episodes when we start a conversation and we wind up somewhere completely unexpected, but it comes out of, you know, the ways that historians ask questions aren't the same ways that cultural critics or that political pundits ask questions. And so you can get into some pretty surprising places. And as Neil always likes to say, everything really does have a history. And so I think some of our more fun segments are the ones where we take something like the taco truck and put it in historical context. That's really fun for us. Yeah, lots of lots of great surprises. And I have to say, there's a great dynamism, great play off of each other dynamic in your podcast where 
each of you brings distinctly different perspectives because you're studying different things, but you also have a shared sensibility about why the past matters and why history matters. Thanks. We have a, a lot of fun doing it. And that was something that when we first started, we were like, well, you know, all of us are kind of political historians of the 20th century. Is there going to be enough difference here? And as we find when we clash every mm -hmm. week, <laughs> there is certainly enough different perspectives to bring to a program like this. That's great. Has it turned out to be more work than you anticipated? Oh, it is definitely a lot of work. I think for me, I'm the producer of the show as well. So I get to spend a good 10 hours or so doing post-production on each episode. The thing that makes it feel like less work is that I think we enjoy doing it so much. And there's something so satisfying, just as in journalism, in putting out a product every week and having something that you can point to and say, hey, that's what I did this week. And that makes it a labor of love and something that I think we all know is taking a lot of time, but that we really love doing. Yeah. And getting feedback, not just simply putting something out and hoping somebody's listening, <laughs> but actually getting feedback through social media, through emails, through whatever. I'm sure you're getting quite a bit of that. Absolutely. It's one of our favorite things is to hear from listeners because it lets us know, A, that someone's out there, um, but also that people really are engaging in it. One of the things that was really important to us is that we make it like a conversation so that our listeners feel like the fourth person at the table and can sort of join along the conversation with us. And when they follow up with us on social media after, then we get that sense of a conversation that we are hoping to foster through the show. So it is something that's really gratifying because it lets us know that we're on the right track. Yeah. In fact, sometimes you do acknowledge the final segment of your show is the uh, what's making history and you each go around the table or the figurative table, um, <laughs> since you're not in the same, not in the same room in most cases. And Occasionally, you have mentioned things that, that were pitched to you or brought to your attention by, uh, by listeners. I guess the same thing for some of the segments as well. So that's, that's great interactivity. Absolutely. We love when people suggest things to us because it often puts us on to topics that we might not normally have covered. And if none of us comes in with a particularly strong past with a particular topic, that's also when you get led into some really creative and interesting directions. Well, congratulations on your first anniversary of Past Present and congratulations on your book, it's really terrific. And Nicole Hammer, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us at In the Past Lane. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. Nicole Hammer is author of Messengers of the Right, Conservative Media and the Transformation of American Politics, just published by Penn Press. And Nicole is co-host and producer of the terrific podcast, Past Present, which you all should check out. You can find links to Nicole's book, her weekly column at U.S. News & World Report, her Twitter handle, and her podcast, Past Present, at inthepastlane.com. All right, folks, time to wrap this thing up. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please let us know what you think about this episode by communicating with us via Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you want to know more about the topics we've discussed in this episode, then check out the show page for this episode at our website, inthepastlane.com. This show page also has information about our guests, correspondents, and other contributors. And it has a list of credits for the music that's part of each episode, plus a list of the great people that help make this episode possible, including our executive producer, Lulu Spencer. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world, so let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, word is you're starting to warm up to this whole history thing. God, this is so pathetic. SBI. Snoring Beagle International. Mm -hmm.